thank you all of you who have tuned in to uh, participate and hear us hear this conversation. Uh, my name is Autumn McDonald and I am the head of New America California. New America is a think and action tank based out of DC and we are also a civic enterprise. Uh, so we do a lot of work related to economic equity, uh, income to jobs, voice, uh, power, if you will. Um, and so we're really thrilled to have you all here joining us for this conversation. This is the fourth and final session in our series COVID in the Black community. And this session is focusing in on Black community voice, civic engagement, and identity's role in safety and resilience. We are going to uh, get started in just a few moments, but I first wanted to just let you know who, who is uh, with us. So we have uh, Alicia Hatch, who is the Vice President and Chief of Campaigns at Color of Change. We have Dr. Joseph Marshall, who is the co-founder and executive director of Alive and Free, and also a MacArthur Genius Fellow. We have Latifa Simon, who is president of the Akhenati Foundation and is also a MacArthur Genius Fellow. Thank you all, uh, Dr. Marshall, Orisha, and Latifa for joining us. Really looking forward to this conversation. For those of you tuned in, if you're interested in taking the conversation online, please feel free to do so uh, with your social media uh, tool of choice. Uh, and please tag New America California if you, and the speakers if you are um, interested in doing so. Finally, I want to thank the MacArthur Foundation and Cash App for helping to make this conversation possible. With that, let's go ahead and get started. I wanted to start with you, Dr. Marshall. I wanted to start us off by just giving a sense, uh, getting a sense rather of you, uh, your story, if you could tell us a little bit more about you. What is your two minute story and how does it relate to how you are experiencing this moment, if you will? Well, that would take more than two minutes. So I'm gonna give you the, the cliff notes version. I, I mean, I re first I gotta say hi to Latifa. I've known Latifa a long time. We are close in different ways. Maybe she'll tell. I'm not telling. <laughs> um, uh, I've been working with youth all my life, really, since I walked out of college. And, uh, you know, went from a teacher to an administrator and then started my own youth program. Basically, it's a violence prevention program. I uh, wanted to keep kids. A lot, of my, a lot of my former students were falling into drugs and gangs and that sort of thing. And so I decided I wanted to do something about that and opened my big mouth and said, if you could stay on the right track, you know, I pay for your college education. By the way, never say that. Well, I'm happy to say that this year we're going to have 250 college graduates. Um, but that led me to doing a lot of other things. Uh, a lot of people asked me how I was able to uh, stop young people from getting into trouble. I developed this model, which I call the Alive and Free Prescription, which is looking at violence from a disease standpoint. Um, it, it's as close to a medical model as you can get. So, um, you know, the, the, I changed the name, or at least the, the, the name, the, the official name to Alive and Free, because my goal had always been to keep young people alive and free and unharmed uh, by violence. Um, as I began to teach others, one of the persons that noticed that I was, uh, you know, doing well with this was the man who is now the current governor of the state of California. Gavin Newsom was a mayor at that time, and then he asked me to become a member of the San Francisco Police Commission, which I asked him, why'd you do that? And he said, because you are fair. So I stepped into a world uh, I had never done. It was very intimidating at the beginning, but for 14 years I was, and I got in there because my young people were being involved with the police. It was simple. I, don't want, I wanted to make sure those things went fair. Uh, those encounters were, were, were okay. And so for the last 14 years, I just got off, two years off. I was on a police commission trying to uh, do something about police accountability and reform. We had a very serious incident out here, uh, basically our George Floyd, and we were pushed into fast track in doing uh, police reform. And um, so that's pretty much <laughs> the two things I bring to this conversation is my work with young people and, um, and uh, my, my things around police reform. That's, that's about two minutes, but it started a long time ago. I've been, you know, since I was the president of BSU at my university, so <laughs> started a long time. All right. Fantastic. I appreciate that. I would love to dig in just a little bit deeper. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about Alive and Free, just, you know, what, what you guys are up to, 
and specifically how the concept of violence as, as a disease and also the focus on young people came to be. Uh, love to hear a little bit more about that. Well, it came to be because I, I was a teacher and when you know you get a letter from one of your kids that you thought was going to college and he's in jail, you know, for selling drugs or you know, you end up going to his funeral, uh, a student funeral, uh, or it, it, it just floored me. And so I wanted to be able to uh, help the kids, you know, basically stay alive and free. That was my thing. I always say that. I want to, you know, stay alive and free. And I want to develop a sh what I call a surefire way of doing that. Um, I, want, I knew it was more than just, you know, my desire or my efforts. There's a lot of good teachers around that really want to do something. I wanted to make it as, 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 as uh, scientific as I possibly could. So I came up with this, I call it a prescription, and it involves, you know, risk factors for violence. It involves uh, the thinking that goes into violence. It goes, it, 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 it deals with, you know, the uh, emotional residue that young people have. Um, and we gave them some rules to live by because uh, I want to replace the thinking that they had, you know, with regard to trying to be streetwise. So um, I really thought this was, my, my laboratory has always been young people. Uh, I'm much better with kids than I am with adults, I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, they would come in and people would say, yeah, but violence is everywhere. So then it became, you know, uh, the disease of violence uh, around the world. And I've been really lucky to identify, I mean, my goal is a world without incarceration and a world without, uh, without violence, which is like shooting for the moon, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, this prescription, in fact, I've been getting a lot of calls with COVID and people are saying, Doc, they may not have a cure for COVID, but you got a cure. We got a cure for the disease. Um, people just aren't necessarily w willing to listen. Um, but yeah, it's very specific and the kids follow it. And uh, you know, that's how they're able to, you know, even in a world full of violence, uh, how they're able to avoid the violence uh, themselves, even being, either being a victim or a perpetrator of violence. I know it sounds crazy, but I've never lost a kid who follows the prescription. Thank you for sharing that. And it's great to hear about the um, success you've had with engaging with young people and, and pushing in the way that you have for the last several decades. Uh, I am curious if you would tell me a little bit about what you think the opportunity is in this moment. And so what I'll, I'll preface that with is that when I was in grad school, we used to talk about policy windows. Oh, there's this policy window. There's this opportunity to do this thing. And I, I wonder what your thoughts on how this doesn't become kind of like a moment, like an activism fad, if you will, that we look back, you know, six months from now, 10 years from now, and just think of it as kind of like a, a moment that we went through and then we kind of went back to, you know, bounced back into the old ways. Are you, do you have any ideas about what, what's possible with this opportunity? One, one of the advantages of living a long time is that you've seen a lot. <laughs> so I've seen this before. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles, and you remember the Rodney King, what happened after Rodney King? Well, I was there for the first Watts riots <laughs> then. So I've seen this several times. Um, and I want to say a lot, something good came out of all of that. Uh, did it solve all the problems? No. I always say this is a marathon relay race, you know, for equality, freedom, and justice. And you know, there's always something to be worked on. Having said that, I have a very good friend, uh, named Clarence Jones. And he is Martin Luther King's personal attorney and speechwriter. And I was talking to Clarence the other day. He's sort of my mentor. And he said he's never seen anything like this. Um, this moment in time, uh, he said even more so than when he, you know, when, when King was marching. Um, so I think, I, I, I think what we've seen around the nation, but more importantly around the world, uh, is, 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 is very significant. And I mean, you never know. It depends on how our people work. If there was a time, what's, what's the phrase to keep your eyes on the prize? This is the time to keep your eyes on the prize. I mean, I'm a worker. So um, my big thing is when the marches stop, and I don't want them to stop, the work has to be done. You don't get anything without working. And what does Frederick Douglass to say? If there is no struggle, there is no progress. So I think this is a moment of time. I, 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 and I'm taking full advantage of it. And I hope everybody else does about everything, about policing, about racism, about any, any of those issues, please, you have permission now, if you were looking for it, go for it. 
Thank you. And I like that idea of the marathon relay race because, you know, it's, it's definitely a long haul, but relay makes me think about how people need to take up the baton from the person before. Uh, and so I, I like that a lot. I have two more questions I want to ask you, and then I do want to incorporate all of you together um, after I've kind of asked each of you a few questions. But you mentioned your role on the San Francisco Police Commission, and there's been a lot of talk right now, right, about what does it look like to reform policing? Uh, what is the right language to use when we talk about reforming policing? Uh, things like that. I'm, I'm curious if they're in, at a high level. I no, by no means expect you to have the answer for everything everywhere, but um, if you just share your thoughts on what you think um, kind of makes the most sense or just your general thoughts would be great. Well, it's crucial if you're going to have a department and Minneapolis has decided <laughs> you may not do that. I don't know, years ago, Camden, I actually dismantled this police, this police department and, 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 and brought did something different. But if you're gonna have a police department, I really think there are certain things you need to have. First of all, I would say you gotta have a, civ a civilian oversight. If you don't have civilian oversight, you probably don't have, you don't want the police looking at the police. Somebody's gotta be looking at them. And to me, it should be civilians. I remember in Ferguson, there was no civilian oversight. One of the reasons that they moved forward is they, they put some sort of civilian oversight. San Francisco has probably more civilian oversight than anybody. We got two of them, uh, but, but it's necessary. So I think that's first. And then next, you know, uh, you gotta have a very good use of force policy, uh, but with a bunch of things in it. I mean, everything from, you know, body cameras and probably time and distance and, and de-escalation, uh, 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 Right to intervene, uh, having officers intervene. So, an excellent use of force policy. President Obama talked about that the other day. Whatever city you're in, take a look at your use of force policies. But, but, and so I think those two things are the main thing to begin with. I mean, you got to look at training, you got to look at uh, recruitment, you got to look at all that, uh, you know, bias, unconscious bias, unconscious bias. There's a whole bunch of things. Uh, I think a big thing, it, when officers decide to not let officers, do what they want to do, that'll probably be a big thing. That's a hard thing to do because they see themselves as a fraternity. Um, and, but it can also always be improved just this morning. And London, uh, I mean, um, uh, as Lee Tifa knows, Mayor Breed here put some more things out. Uh, you know, and we got to, we've been doing pretty good, but we, we, we can always do better. So those are the things basically, I think, uh, to start a civilian oversight. I've been talking to people around the country that don't have civilian oversight, and they've asked me, you know, how do you do it? Uh, and you use the force policy or at least basis to begin to have good police. And, and probably in the end, you, you, you got to get people, you know, to protect and serve. I, I don't like the term community policing. I like the term public relations policing because really in the end, you got to, you got to get people, every encounter that a person has with a police officer, and I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, so you can imagine the encounters I had with police, is uh, can shape the way you see police forever. So, you know, I think uh, how departments train police to deal with the public will go along uh, a long way to having things change. And of course, you got to get rid of people that don't belong there. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. It, it made me think of, I think, the Chris Walk uh, joke, or well, it's not even a joke. It's really serious about you can't have bad apples. There are certain professions where that you, there's just no space for bad apples. Um, but uh, I would love to ask you one last quick question, which is related to um, identity in general. Uh, I noticed on your website that you have some uh, different events listed and one of them is a Kwanzaa celebration. And so I'm interested in how culture and identity play into your work uh, as it relates to both working with kids in general, as you think of this moment, you know, what it means to be, to, be, uh, to identify as black, to be black. Um, what are your thoughts on how that plays into how you show up? I tell the kids all the time, I would not be doing this work. And I, I was a good kid in college. I was a nice guy, you know. But had I not read the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was 19 years old, I'd probably be working on my third BMW. I always tell the kids. And I certainly wouldn't be paying for kids to go to college that weren't my own. Uh, Malcolm was just opened my eyes to everything. And the big thing he opened my eyes to was history and culture. I mean, I didn't know anything. Literally, I knew George Washington Carver and everybody else knew. But I always knew growing up in my neighborhood that there was something wasn't right. And he helped me, he put his finger on something wasn't right. And then when he opened that door, he opened the door, not just to history in this country, 
but I had never heard of, you know, Imhotep. I had never heard of Kemet. I had never heard of any of that stuff. And they always tell, I, you know, young people come in here and they say, you know, we're the descendants of slaves. And I tell them, well, first thing I tell them, you're not descendants of a slave, you're descendant of free people who were captured and enslaved. And the first thing they talk about is what was it like before? So history and culture drives everything around here. Uh, it, it's still a huge void. Um, and uh, I'm, it's funny, a young man, one of my young men, I hooked him with, and he was a drug dealer at the time. And I said, if you knew what I knew, you wouldn't do what you do. And he said, what do you know? And what he didn't know was the history and culture that I knew. And it, it drives everything around here. Every single thing is based on uh, our history, our culture, and uh, you know our beauty, our, our grace, and all that we can achieve. Hmm. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. I want to pull Latifa into this. And Latifa, I know that the Akhenati Foundation does a lot related to culture and art um, in, in the uh, racial justice work that you do. But before we go there, can you take two minutes to tell us your story? Who are you? Um, you know, it's interesting. I've known Dr. Marshall. You're not aging, Dr. Marshall, and I am. So it's, 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 it's kind of weird. You look exactly the same. I don't know what kind <laughs> of emotion you're using. Um, I was a young person involved in a lot of craziness in San Francisco, and I became a youth organizer. Um, and so Dr. Marshall was one of the, literally, we caught one of the street soldiers, him and Jack Jacqua, doing work with young people on the streets and in jail, young people who were on probation. Um, and he started a really popular radio show that is still on the air that brothers and sisters by the thousands listen to every Sunday that is intergenerational. But also my late husband, by the way, it'll be six years, Dr. Marshall, on Monday. Mm. He passed away on Father's Day in 2014. Kevin Weston was a radical journalist who was also best friends with your son, a radical journalist. Um, yeah. So we're family. Um, and we're family in, in the, the larger context of wanting to ensure that there's a roadmap for freedom for all people who've experienced depression. Um, so again, I came to the work as a young person, um, not just in need of services, but somebody who needed and, and, and deserved a community to find her power. Um, and uh, being at the Center for Young Women's Development, now the Young Women's Freedom Center, a 25-year-old organization that does just that, training young women um, to understand that they too deserve a pathway, uh, both to employment, freedom, uh, politic, and a clear understanding that they can actually change policy, both on the individual, or their futures, I should say, both on the individual and from policy and organizing uh, change. So that, that shifted my life. And um, I then went on to do a lot of work inside and outside of government and worked with Kamala, um, developed a reentry initiative. She was then DA Harris. Um, and went on to lead and run some, some great organizations focused on civil rights and racial justice. And now I'm the president of the Akhenati Foundation um, that was founded by uh, Quinn Delaney and Wayne Jordan. Akhenati was funding the Center for Young Women's Development when you know, we launched our first campaign to ban the shackling of pregnant incarcerated girls when they were given birth in juvenile hall in 1999. And so it's beautiful to be on the other side of the table. Um, so that's my two minutes. Um, but yeah, it's really beautiful to be in conversation with you all today. You already told us a little bit about the focus of the Akhenati Foundation, and I know that one of the values is that kind of cultural expression. I had the benefit of going to a few of the different events that you had where you had um, really artist activists um, talking and, and sharing their work. Can you tell us a little bit why, a little bit more about why it's important to have that as a piece of the work, the culture, the identity, yeah. the art? Yeah, I mean, and it's not a new concept where funding uh, what is has always been seminal in movements for justice in this country there's never been a movement of, of suffrage i'm not just talking about voting but of of folks coming together to fight against whether it's structural inequities without culture being centered whether it be visual art or cultural art sort of ethnic art um, we have to remember it was fanny lou hamer who was literally the voice of the civil rights movement the snick singers um, were the, at the front of every march that we read about these big marches it was the singers it was the the, the folks who who literally did the black panthers there were, they had artists who actually drew these beautiful images of, of what power could look like on paper, not just in real life. You'll notice that downtown Oakland, California is a, a, a living um, gallery now to struggle and freedom. The boarded up boards you know, on, on all of these buildings that were damaged in the uprising 
cultural artists and organizers understand that this moment must never be forgotten. They put it up these beautiful images throughout the town, um, expressing really this, this promise of hope. Culture always seems to come before um, movement. They are the visionaries. They're sort of the artists and architects, if you would imagine, of things that we can't imagine, we can't see. Um, so culture as power, as a, a, a clear vision, an understanding of, of how movements move. The Akhenati Foundation has always funded uh, culture as a form of resistance. During the COVID moment, what's really important, we, uh, our board allowed us to take a million dollars, and we're a small family foundation, out of our reserves to create a fund that did four things, and this is important. Art and culture first, voice, meaning good journalism in this moment so that people who look like the people that are moving movements are actually telling the correct stories and getting the information into East, into the West, right, into the fruit field, to people who really need to hear the, not only the, the stories of desperation, but the stories of triumph. Um, and we're also funding organizing, like, like good base building, power building in communities. The reform that you see that is happening around the country or the conversations about it from governments on high, it would not be for uh, the folks in the streets and the artists um, and the organizers and the bullhorns um, and, and honestly the cities burning that brought people to this conversation of international reckoning on race. And we believe that culture is always at the front of that game. Wow, that's really powerful. And it's like you're clairvoyant because I was going to ask you about how are things different in any way if they are related to the COVID era or as it relates to um, what's been going on in terms of um, the recent attention to police brutality. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So, uh, you, I'm sorry, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I felt like you kind of went there already. If you want to add something to that, by all means, I had another question for you because I felt like you kind of answered that. But let me let me pause. You go ahead and answer that, and then I'll ask you another question. You know, you know, we have, you know, I can't wait to hear Orisha speak as well. And um, because, yeah, we just, there's so much beauty and in, in storytelling and history. Um, it, I can't imagine being alive in the time of the Watts riots. My grandmother, her family had businesses um, on Black Wall Street in, uh, in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, and then their racial terror ravaged, you know, generations of folks figuring out how to survive on land um, where they were not welcomed. So this moment for me, if we're, histor if, if we're not ahistorical, and we remember what Malcolm X said, um, he said, I don't have a chip on my shoulder. You have your foot in my neck, right? For black and brown men, um, clearly there is opportunity for us to understand the horrors of racialized terror in this country that they um, have endured. And it is also the reality um, that if you put a, a international recession on top of not just the images that we saw of Floyd's murder, but we know the intense sort of militarization of communities, you just know that it's there. Um, a jobless rate that is double for black and brown folks. Um, the tensions of this moment are unprecedented. But again, thinking about culture as a, a weapon for resistance and power and love and community building, um, we have an opportunity, as Dr. Marshall said, to figure out our pathway forward that, that every, again, not just here, but internationally, when people have decided that there's no, no more of this, a radical imagination, develops in real folk in real time figure out how to survive um, so yeah we're in this moment people are literally dying um, in our hospitals they're dying in their homes and then you have this 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 spiritual demand all over the world to think about how we can be better to each other in the face of that pain and the face of tyranny uh, by government leaders or by law enforcement leaders who won't get their act together um, and it's faced also, it's mirrored with folks who are leaders who are saying we can do better. We can see and transform ourselves into a new future. Thank you so much for that. It made me think of so many different things. I liked the way you were talking about identity and culture. I loved the way that you were talking about the ways in which that is kind of pulling us forward in this powerful way to be kind of resilient in this moment. I was thinking about some of the things we were seeing as people were just trying to wear their masks. 
as you know asked and really you know told that they needed to do and you know black people being followed around black and brown people being followed around stores and being um finding that it, it was difficult to do this thing that was going to help them stay more stay healthy and the community stay healthy i was looking at some of the figures that said that it is indeed about three times as many the fatality from covid is about three times as much for within the black community uh, there's so many things here that are related to like, what does this look like moving forward? And you've spoken to a lot of it, but I want to ask the similar question that I did of Dr. Uh, Marshall, which is this question of how does this not become a racial and social justice blip? Like, yeah. I know, you know, we, we've, we've seen this kind of stuff before we had, you know, two steps forward, three steps backlash. What, what, what is the, what is the piece that, that makes this different? Everybody says it's gotta be different. How is it different? Well, it is different in, in that it is in this country, you know, to the comments made earlier, we saw the largest collective human rights show of, of, of anger, support, rage, and love for something different, just in the last two weeks. Um, people were in the street, not only all over this country, but all over the world, um, you know, chanting a the nomenclature that solidifies the humanity of black lives. I don't, I mean, my God. So what we have to make sure, those of us in philanthropy and in justice work and in academia, um, you know, we give tenor to this moment, but we also, we must be very clear that this is not a, a racial justice Coachella, right? This is not a playground. This is an opportunity to move a nation uh, forward towards the promise of democracy and what is written um, at the base of the Statue of Liberty. In our own organizations that where we're calling for equity, I would ask that the leaders start thinking about what does justice look like, not only outside, but in your own organizations, and that not just Black leaders, but that we have an intersectional and internationalist politic of how to do right uh, in every institution that we play in, and in and, and giving. For me, you know, working in a foundation, um, we have a responsibility to stop the disrespect of Black leaders, um, the divestment of Black leaders, the quote-unquote white vetting of Black leadership. I'm extremely excited that every single time that I pick up the paper in the last couple of weeks, everyone is wrestling with this idea of anti-Blackness and that multiculturalism should never uh, dilute the reality that anti-Blackness is at the core um, of so, so much of what's wrong in this country and it can be cured. It is a virus. Racism and anti-Blackness is a virus, but it must be recognized and it will not, absolutely not be diminished just by having 200,000 people in the streets. It will take work and a commitment. Um, and folks need to, it is raining, it is storming. Uh, the dollars are just not all that needs to roll because we need to be doing that too. But we need to make a commitment to each other that your statements from your corporations and your foundations should absolutely be mirrors to your own activities. So I think that we're stepping up and um, we have to hold ourselves accountable every day in this moment or we are complicit um, we're complicit. Ooh, okay then. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Latifa. Very much uh, appreciate it. I want to bring Arisha now into the conversation. And again, I will be bringing you all back together. Um, but Arisha, I want to know a little bit about you. It's interesting. I realized, I think that we were both, um, we're both uh, Stanford alum, but I don't think we were there maybe at the same time. But anywho, long and short, tell us about yourself. Yeah, and um, I want to appreciate you, Autumn, for making me follow the geniuses, um, if that's the plural for genius, um, and I just really appreciated um, hearing that, uh, hearing the perspective and the wisdom. Um, my name is Arisha Hatch. I'm the vice president and chief of campaigns at Color of Change. Um, I've worked at Color of Change for eight years. Uh, I joined in 2012, and two weeks later, Trayvon Martin was killed. Um, this was my for first experience doing racial justice organizing or civil rights organizing, and so um, my perspective is within the, the, the scope of 2012 until now. Um, I am also the daughter of Patricia, a retired elementary school teacher, and the daughter of Ollie, who was an insurance salesman. Uh, my dad passed away, unfortunately, um, in the beginning of March, just before the shelter in place orders sort of 
in place here in California. And so I'm really um, viewing this uh, uh, moment as uh, a person who has not only been doing this sort of work for the last eight years, but also as a daughter who's lost her father. Um, the moment that has like struck me most in the last several weeks is that video of Gigi Floyd on the top of G uh, Stephen Jackson's arm saying, daddy changed the world, daddy changed the world. Um, and so I'm like viewing this, again, viewing this through the lens of uh, a person who is trying to make meaning out of her father's death. Um, and I really think, um, and so to see this young girl saying that our dad changed the world, I really think it's our duty and our obligation as organizers to help to actually realize that for Gigi. Like she deserves to have that opinion and that feeling about her father. And so um, that's what's kept me motivated um, along with a lot of caffeine the last several weeks. Thank you for that. And thanks for also sharing Daughter Of. Uh, I can't remember exactly, was it Girl Trek who started this? Daughter Of, that was uh, trending on Twitter and other places, but I, I like this idea. Who are you the daughter of? So thank you for sharing that with us. I'm one, so I can't even acknowledge that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would love to learn just a little bit more about Color of Change. I, I'm familiar with Color of Change, but I'd love for those who are new to the organization to have a sense of the work that you do. Can you kind of break it into kind of the C3, the C4, um, the, in the way that you guys uh, operate? Sure. Color of Change is one of the largest Black-led racial justice organizations in the country. Um, we were founded in the aftermath of Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina by Van Jones and James Rucker, actually right outside of the, the Bay Area, out of someone's living room. Um, you know, our founders saw Black people stranded on their rooftops um, and realized that this was a moment that showed the absence of independent Black political power um, as corporations called us looters, as, uh, the gover as government officials patted themselves on the back for a job well done. Uh, uh, our founders um, went out to their friends and family and asked um, them to join in a new civil rights organization that uh, would try to hold powerful decision makers responsible and accountable to Black people. Um, we think about our work every day as coming, um, coming in and giving people small, easy things to do that went str easy, strategic things to do that when added together um, have the ability, ability to leverage real world change. Um, and so uh, that's how we think about our work. Every single day, um, we are shown media stories in the media that animate us. We view our job as giving people something strategic to do in that moment before they move on to the next thing that's upset them. It's interesting because that dovetails into this piece about like, what does it mean to actually start a movement, right? Like how is a movement born? Um, and it was really interesting to hear how Color of Change started. Uh, my, um, my husband is from New Orleans, so all my in-laws, I have a lot of people now who are in New Orleans. Uh, and I've, I've heard many stories, very, very touching stories of, of what that experience looked like and what it felt like to feel very much left behind and overlooked and even uh, thought to be, you know, doing something wrong when you were just trying to survive. Um, I would love to have a sense from you if there's anything that's different in what it is to build a movement uh, in this COVID era or with this recent attention, I keep calling it recent attention because it's not recent police brutality. Um, but if you, if you could tell us a little bit about if anything's different, I'm assuming maybe it's not, but like, what does this look like for you in this time and what does it mean to keep a movement going or get it started? Um, well, we're definitely a part of a broad movement ecosystem um, that has been working for generations in the marathon of a relay race. But, um, you know, there are definitely like some ways in which you know, the organization has been, been impacted. We're now sort of in silos in our own homes. Um, uh, but in a lot of ways, um, color of change, um, at least the digital work was sort of built for a pandemic. Like the number of people that were texting Floyd to 55156, like, like we like to think that those are folks 
that maybe went out and protested, but also maybe weren't able to um, because of so many different reasons. Um, and this is what this was their way of participating. Um, you know, the biggest impact on our, our organization is that we do have um, volunteer teams all across the country um, who are really focused on empowering Black joy. And so they've been hosting Black women's brunches over, over the year. They've been hosting cookouts. They've um, they've been doing all sorts of things to bring Black people together, um, not necessarily in low P political ways, uh, to sort of help build power locally. Um, and so there, there's had to be a lot of creativity and imagination about uh, what community looks like in this moment. Um, you know, so we've had, you know, there, everybody's moved to the virtual uh, you know, Zoom parties. We've had um, teams of people who uh, uh, had a drive through and gave away food to folks in their community that needed it um, while maintaining, you know, the six feet distancing. Um, we had folks just two days ago um, uh, in Houston after George Floyd's um, uh, funeral opened up a, a parking lot where they could, where folks could come after the funeral, where they could do a repass and where they were also registering voters and talking to folks, trying to recruit people to their team um, for future work. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, I have seen uh, the organizers and activists that I work with come more alive in this moment. Like as soon as the pandemic hit, folks locally were like organizing to make sure their kids had internet or iPads or laptops so that they can continue their education. Um, more people are taking action than ever before. More than prior to two weeks ago, we had 1.7 million folks that had taken action in the last um, eight months. And um, we've had more than 7 million people take action in the last three weeks. Um, so it has been um, you know, a huge moment of activity despite um, the public health crisis, the dual public health crises that we face. Yeah, thank you for that. And I appreciate uh, some of the examples that you've given of how people are showing up if they can, can't leave their house, uh, if there are other reasons that uh, they can't do it in the way that some others are in terms of um, literally being out there with, with a sign. Uh, this session is the fourth in our COVID in the Black community session. The first one was on the health disparity. The second one was on education disparity. And I noticed you mentioned kind of internet connections and people getting linked in for online learning. Uh, the third one was on economic precarity and on the disparity uh, that uh, black and brown communities are experiencing in that on that front. This last one is about this idea of voice and, and power, if you will, the ability to engage and do something really meaningful. I'd love to kind of look first your general thoughts about like what that can look like or the, the power that is inherent in voice. Uh, and then after that, I was going to ask you to tell me a little bit about whatever you guys are doing related to the census or voting in general. Uh, just a couple examples. Uh, things are moving so fast. One of the reasons I'm, 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 have you been watching what these athletes are doing? These athletes ain't playing. I mean, did you realize the NASCAR flag is now gone? I mean, the Confederate flag is now gone in NASCAR? There are so many things happening so fast by people willing to say, no, you know, it, it's, it's got to change and then standing on it. It's just, it's happening every day. Uh, the stands that, I mean, particularly, you know, LeBron, wow. I mean, the, the, he just formed this movement to do something about uh, not only voting, but voter suppression. I mean, that's huge. He's going to organize athletes. Everybody's doing something in their own way, using their voice and, and making change. I mean, the NFL is completely, not, well, now Kaepernick's wonderful. He's a hero, right? You, you can kneel. I mean, there's just stuff, going, and you, you can't even predict what's going to happen. But what I like are the very practical things that folks are coming up with to, to, make, to make significant change in, in institutions uh, and in people's personal lives. And uh, I see indicators all the time that think, there's going to be things that are going to be different now. What I want to say is, I, I want to get people, I, I tell my kids that work with kids, right? That, that what we're trying to change is a very stubborn animal. This thing has been around for a long, long, long time. I mean, it goes back to the time when, you know, when uh, Napoleon shot the lifts off the pyramid. Okay, so it goes, this is a long, this is entrenched. And so you, you got to be prepared to be able to work through disappointment. And you got to be able, you got to be prepared 
to work through without guarantees. Uh, uh, you know, there are no guarantees and you're going to get disappointed. But it seems like people are energized and, you know, when you get down, you know, call me and I'll pick you up. But <laughs> I see voices making a difference all the time uh, on a daily basis and uh, they, they, we just got to keep it up. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it because I think that that's kind of at the crux of what what we're talking about today. I would love for Alicia and Latifa if you have any thoughts about the power of community voice to jump in there as well. Alicia, I think that that's exactly what y'all do. So I want to listen and learn. There's a lot going on at Color of Change. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the ideas that we talk about a lot um, is this idea of the power. Um, and we are, you know, Black people are at the center of a national global conversation right now. Um, we've seen how a number of corporations have responded. Millions of people have taken to the streets. You know, I've seen of allies doing die-ins on freeways, all sorts of things. Um, but I think um, uh, the challenge of translating that press into real power, um, and that's the window. These folks that have been staying in the streets, risking their health um, uh, for, to keep this conversation going. Um, it is important that we uh, use this window that they've created for us to actually grab power. Um, and so while I have loved to see all of these corporations speak up and speak out as I talk to folks that have been doing organizing much longer than I have, that has felt like one unique aspect of this moment, although folks have seen lots of different moments. But, you know, putting up a graphic that says Black Lives Matter one day or making a donation one day does not absolve you um, from actually doing it in ways in which um, your corporation breeds inequality, breeds disparities. And so I'm actually looking, for, looking forward to the moment as someone that does a lot of corporate accountability work um, at Color Change to pull that list of people that were so outraged and excited to show up for us just after Memorial Day and go back to them and say, okay, these are the other places that you have power. Um, and these are the other, the other um, ways in which we expect you to sort of change your behavior if you believe, if you agree with the values that you've been espousing the last couple of weeks. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Um, I don't have much to add actually, but I think that in terms of accountability for folks who assume power, whether they make the big bucks or not. I'm learning as a local elected. I get about twelve hundred dollars a month for my VART service. And I think as a police commissioner, what uh, Uncle Joe, you probably got a couple hundred. But there are people who are really benefiting from the power that they have. And uh, there's no eighty three dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> but so you know but when you take on those roles, hopefully they're, they're these are roles of service. And so elected leaders have to do the right thing too. People are yielding power and asking for a transformation of sorts. And I don't think that there's anybody um, in any conversation um, from your most radical to sort of middle of the world liberal that doesn't see uh, not only an opportunity but a demand for a revisioning of how we keep us safe. We meeting all of us in communities. That the old notion of doing things, the re, just the retraining or just the hiring. You know, actually, folks are saying, being very, very creative. We need a line item every single public safety budget to understand what does it mean to keep us safe, and for those questions to be litigated. That's good for us to be able to be thinking about. Um, mental health workers being in schools instead of armed police officers or compulsory preschool, like in some of the safest nations in the world where there's free transportation for young people or that there's a minimum wage that ensures um, that you have the basic needs met and still that's not enough. That's not excellence, that's sustenance. These conversations are not new ones. Um, that are, are not So thank goodness for the people who have remained in this work. Uh, for years and years and years, both you know, on preventive and what we call interventionists, um, those folks who are trying to figure out what safety looks like, creating new opportunities and ideas. And again, for the, the opportunity for folks who have, I said, the power of your index finger to press no, yes, or abstain, it's on you. It's on you too, because the people of this country have showed what they need and what they want. They want not only a new conversation, they want a new way of doing things. Um, a woman who is 
dealing with a domestic violence situation, wants to be able to pick up her phone and call for help and know that everybody in the house is not gonna be laid out. That's not too much to ask, right? It's not too much to ask for Johnny when he has a breakdown um, in the second grade because he might have buried his father or seen somebody in his family waiting five hours for 30 minutes at a local prison. He's acting up on Tuesday um, that he deserves not only a hug, he deserves deep supports when he's in school. He deserves a beautiful lunch and daycare for his mother who's working three jobs. These are not radical ideas. These are the ideas that folks who are deep down in community have been purporting forever and ever and ever. And they're tired of the malaise. And so we yield that power and that voice. And we also have to make sure that the leaders who've accepted the challenge to keep people safe uh, or to, to make decisions to make our communities better, that they hear this fire and they do something about it. Because you know we still live in a democracy. We, sh we all should be held to task. What appointed people, elected folks, and folks who are giving out resources. We are the least accountable. And the people who pay are the people who pay with their lives. They pay with their children's futures. So um, I can't say more than I think I've said of how thrilled I am and many of us are in this moment, but also how much we weep, um, how, how much blood whether it's from fratricide, I learned that term for you, doctor, years back. I was like, what is that? You said it on the radio, when brothers are killing brothers. Um, when folks in community are deeply involved um, in violence, and also when that violence comes from the state, none of it is acceptable, and it keeps us from our liberty. Folks need to hear and understand, and together we're going to figure our way out of this. Mm. That's really powerful, and I appreciate it because I feel like all of you have said something really meaningful as it relates to that voice, to power, to how we all can show up in this moment. I would love to take this opportunity for those who are tuned in and those who might be watching this recording after the fact to hear from each of you if you have some ideas. What would you want them to do? I'm, I'm not suggesting that you are like, here's the answer. But let's say, you know, what you do, you have the ears of some CBO leaders, you have some philanthropy folks, you have public sector people, you have business. Uh, what, and you have people who are just people in the community who want to do something. What would you ask them to do? What's your call to action for them? And I'm going to put it in two different ways. What's your call to action in terms of maybe one policy that you think that they should get behind? And what's your call to action and maybe like a, a smaller step thing they can do, like a real life thing? I'll start with Alicia. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and so you're asking around criminal justice specifically or? Um... You know what, I'll take anything that you feel like is, if it's a good policy that you feel like people should get behind, maybe it has to do with voting or the census or anything else. If there's, whatever is a policy that you think people need to get behind this. Yeah, I, step. I think especially on the criminal justice front, um, a lot of people are hearing about the defund movement for the first time, although it's been around for a long time. Like thing, whatever's happening in Minneapolis didn't just happen because of what happened on Memorial Day. These have been folks that have been organizing and have had a different vision uh, for community safety for a very, very long time. Um, and so for me, um, uh, policies connected to like investing in communities and divesting from police departments are incredibly important for us to be considering. Um, we're at a moment where that can be like vilified um, and redefined um, in a lot of different ways, but it seems actually like very practical that in the middle of a pandemic um, and always that we should be investing in people's education, that we should be investing in mental health services, that we should be investing in transportation and quality affordable housing. Um, we know that we should be investing in programs like Alive and Free. Like we know that those investments actually make our community safer. They actually reduce crime um, and they uh, allow people to realize their full potential and contribute. Um, to our country in more meaningful ways. And so um, I, I hope that, and this is going to have to happen at, at, in every single county across the country, but I hope that that's the policy that people hold on to and keep fighting for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, what about you, Dr. Marshall? 
it's always difficult for me to tell people what to do, right? Because, I, I mean, I do what I do because I figure this is my passion and uh, uh, I, I, I found my purpose. So it's easy for me to do this. It's hard for me to tell. I mean, it's funny. I get a lot of ideas from other people telling me what to do. And I tell them, no one can do your idea better than you. So don't ask me to do your idea, right? I just did my idea. But um, because things are emerging every day, I, that's why I can't tell somebody what to do now. If you think a law is unfair, then, you know, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of this is around, uh, you know, what, police and, and George Floyd, but as serious, as this is important to me is uh, Armada Arbery and this whole, you know, citizen's arrest thing. I mean, maybe that's not a good law. I still got a problem with staying your ground and Trayvon Martin. Maybe that's not a good law. If you ask me, it's not a good law, but there's so many things that you can that you can jump into this thing, um, supporting an organization, but I, but I can't find that for people. You know, they they got to find that for themselves. Now, I don't mind having conversations with people. Uh, I, I'm lucky. I'm getting emails every day talking about you know, can I talk to you about things? And that's fine. I don't. I have a conversation, uh, and and sort of, they're trying to figure out what to do. Um, but it's it, it's it's it, it's very it, it's it's hard for me to do that. It, it, it really really is. But there is so much to do. I, I will say, uh, what you can help with is there's there's, uh, there's obviously going to be a bit of pushback to this, just because there's always been a pushback when black folks decide to want to <laughs> deal with inequities that have gone on for centuries. Right? There's always a pushback, and. Uh, you can't be part of that problem, whoever it is. You got to be part of the solution. And uh, I, I'm, getting, I'm engaging with Congress. I'm not letting anybody off the hook. I'm really telling you, I got, I belong to a bunch of white organizations. They can't, they can't, they do not want to see me coming, right? Because they are sanctioning this stuff without even knowing it. And I got to have those hard conversations with them. So I think just keeping, I mean, marching is another thing, but keeping these conversations going with people, you know, there's a whole bunch of, that's a whole bunch of people don't even know about this stuff. You're out there, read a book, learn. Read the new Jim Crow. Maybe you get some understanding about what's happened for the last 30 years with black folks. You know, how did the police department get so militarized? That came because of the war on drugs, which is a war on black people. I'm amazed at the ignorance, seriously, that's out there. And I shouldn't be amazed, but, you know, people like... So I think there's nothing wrong with getting you some books, getting read, uh, learning, being versed understanding that you know this is not against anybody uh you know it took for a long time for people to say black lives matter was against anybody it's not against anybody if i say my life matters it doesn't mean your life doesn't it just mean mine does right so stop tripping oh god you get me going girl you going so there so yeah I, if i was just gonna and i've been telling people learn read understand find out what america has really been about you know um and then talk to people like you know, like 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 the folks right here. Uh, if you want to help, you'll find a way to help. But I think you got to really got to get an idea of what's going on. It's not get against anybody. It's trying to change inequities that have been going on for centuries. There are going to be some things that have to change. Uh, that have been. I mean, obviously that 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 Confederate flag is a big deal. It might have been a big deal to you, but look, you got to go. You know, maybe some statues got to go. I don't know. But the point is. Uh, uh, just learn, learn, keep, your, keep, keep, keep learning about what's really happening and understand that this has been going on for a long time. And as Sam Cooke says, for a long time coming, for the change is going to come. I like I that. Right. Uh, I would love to hear uh, what thoughts you have, Latifah. And as you are thinking of that, I just wanted to note to the others that I'm going to segue in just a moment or two to the questions that we've gotten. Uh, from those who are tuned in. So if you also have other thoughts for each other, questions for each other, something you heard someone else said that you want to jump in on, definitely think of that as well. Latifa, yeah. to you. I, th I think of two things right now, and I'm sorry for the flurry in the back. I have a nine-year-old, and uh, for all the parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles, friends, of people who have children, there is no, there's, this summer is ridiculous. Um, and again, put on top of all the, there's no, 
the children are in the house, right? Um, so we're, we're trying to get it together. One, the first thing for me, I would suggest all, for all of us is to move beyond allyship and to think about actually being an accomplice uh, to racial justice and for, again, the democracy and humanity that this country promises. So that means going beyond, um, you know, calling your black friend, checking in on them. I don't know where, who, if there was an email, I don't know, it went everywhere. And I'm happy it did. Everybody was checking on their black friends. I got so many calls, but that's, that's good. That's fine. We want to make sure that folks understand the, the, the deep anguish in this moment. Um, but it goes beyond that, being accomplice to, to something different. Um, that means standing side by side, not just acknowledging that it's a problem, side by side, folks who are leading the way um, and asking good questions. I think that the second thing is, I was asked this the other day um, in a very similar forum of what do I want to tell the people that I love 20 years from now when they're asking mommy or auntie, um, what were you doing in the civil rights movement in 2020? Um, and I was like, oh, that's a good question. It was a young person who asked because we've asked our parents, were you guys marching? What, what, what were you doing? Were you writing letters? We, this is now. Are you going to be someone to tell those folks in 20 years that you watched a lot of CNN and you tweeted, which is fine. Or do you want to have a reflection that you were a part of very difficult conversations and that we were working on our not only our anti-blackness, but our anti-racism, that we were working to be anti-racist, um, that we were reading, like Dr. Marshall said, studying, um, but that we were calling on people in our lives, not just selectives, but the people who hold power and control um, over employment, over opportunities, to unlearn, unlearn so much um, of what has been structured around them, around what safety means, around who's good and who's not, around who's interesting or talented or smart. These, these elements have pervaded the way that we see and treat the world. So you can have tens of thousands of black men who all don't die every year, but are dehumanized by law enforcement and we look away. Or when there's an inflection moment, we all come out and we say no more Trayvons. And then, you know, when it's safe, we, we, we retreat and we go back to our normal lives. To be an accomplice or to be able to say in 20 years that you stood center in a movement would be to consistently fight, fight for the humanization of black people and oppressed people in this country. Right. I would love for us now to just uh, take a moment to go through a few of these questions. I have uh, one that I want to start us off with. And then uh, what I do want to note really quickly, though, is in the interest of time, if you feel like somebody else said it, it's covered. You don't have to say something. But if you feel moved and you feel like you have a, something you'd like to share, by all means, please do. So our first question. Tell, tell Latifa, girl, you turned out good. Girl, go ahead, girl. <laughs> <laughs> My, I'm my old grade. now. I'm not a kid no more. I got a 24 year old daughter. I She's going to law grade, school in three weeks. You know, I got to keep my game my up because these young people are brilliant. My <laughs> dream is to create Latifah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well that's done. what I live for. Go on. <laughs> well done all around. Uh, this first question I have is related to the way in which people get behind a specific policy change such that it doesn't become kind of like a bifurcation where you have, you know, one people who feel this way about it, one people, one set of people who feel this way about it. And I'm not sure if this person meant the two sides of, of uh, the, the actual issue or different people on the same side who think of it differently and that they're splitting their efforts in that way. Um, but you can feel free to answer it in the way that resonates with you. I, I took it to mean when, let's say that people are behind defunding police, if there are different factions within that movement itself, is that a problem um, in how whatever the message is gets said and how effective it can be? And what do we do about that if that's a problem? The, the hardest thing I ever did was being on a police commission. Look, I've been in, Prisons all over the place. I've dealt with gang members. I've dealt with, that's nothing. Being on the police commission and making that change was extremely difficult because it's a process. 
if you aren't willing to go through the process and keep your eyes on the prize, and it's not always what you want, uh, because there's so many, I mean, I had to deal with unions, I had to deal with uh, oh, just all these organizations, I had to deal with public screaming and hollering at me. It's very difficult to do. If you can weather that and get, and get probably, and I think we got most of what we wanted because there are certain things we weren't gonna compromise on. Uh, uh, and we're, we're very happy, but it is tough to do. It is really tough to do. And you gotta have people who are willing. And here's the other thing, you, you gotta support those people while they're doing it. Um, if, if you know somebody is, 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 if you believe in them, if you believe what they're doing is, 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 is a good thing, you gotta support them because they can get discouraged too. Uh, and just say, you know, I'm not, I'm not with this, but it, it is not easy. I, I, it, 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 you, I guess compromise is the right word. I don't think it's, that's probably the word that, you know, even politicians have to use. But we made a lot of really significant policy changes. It was not easy to do, but it's because we literally kept our eyes on the prize and we got what we wanted. But it's something that you just, you gotta be willing to, to sit here and make it happen. Thank you for that. Are there any other uh, uh, kind of additive thoughts? Okay. Oh, go ahead, Alicia. Yeah, um, sort of using the example of the fund, I think um, really taking the time to make sure that we are able to define what that means before other people define it for us um, uh, is a potential pitfall. Um, you know, a lot of these ideas, they sound radical to people, but they're like, really, really not radical. We, you know, we see policing in white communities and white suburbs at Coachella and Burning Man all the time. Um, that is not the same policing that black communities and brown communities and working class communities are getting receiving. Um, uh, and so I think we have to really be brave and sort of defending and defining um, what that means for us. Um, and, uh, you know, to push back against anyone that anyone that is attempting to sort of co-opt that invest, divest message. That's really powerful. It made me think of uh, one of the principles of Kwanzaa to define for ourselves, uh, name for ourselves instead of having it be named or defined by others. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. If you guys are okay with it, I am going to um, go to our next question, which is related to allyship, which now Latifa, I'm going to call accompliceship, <laughs> accomplices. Uh, how have you seen uh, white allies or white accomplices show up? And how has that been different, if it has been, from what you've seen in the past? Is this moment different in how you've seen uh, white allyship? And I, I will upgrade it to successful allyship, which would be accomplice, being an accomplice. Well, I've seen a couple Sorry. examples. I'll, I'll go quick. I think, I think it's just about, it's about being intentional. It's about being intentional. Go, Doc. Well, I've seen a couple of examples. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you what I think has been helpful in this. Uh, there was a, a news clip of, um, of a protest in Los Angeles. And there was these, I guess they felt they were allies these two young white women spraying on the, <laughs> on the building. And uh, the young black women said, don't do that. We didn't ask you to do that. <laughs> they gonna blame us for that. And then she had the camera, this ain't us, this ain't us, this ain't us. And what struck me that moment is that, is that the two white girls like, I don't care what you say, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, right? Uh, instead of the unwillingness to take direction uh, and understand that, you know, you ain't really helping us, you hurting us. You just doing what you want to do. I don't think that's allyship, okay? The other part I've seen is, is like having conversations and, you know, being, being, being willing. And I'm not saying people, black people have to be in the lead. I'm not saying that. I'm saying listening to, I mean, a lot of list, I mean you got to listen and understand just because you want to jump out there and join in, it may not be the best for, you know, for everything. And I hate to say this, but they have a tendency to do that. I've experienced that. 
I've had people who I meet that think I can do, they, they can do better than I do at what I do, and they don't even do it because it's just an idea that they have in their heads that somehow they can do things better than black folks, right? I've seen that personally. So I think, you know, being willing to listen, I'm, listen, the big thing to me is listen, you know, uh, get some understanding about what's going on and see how you fit in rather than just jumping out there and, uh, because that's been a tendency. It's been a ten. I hate to say this, but it's been a tendency for so long that they just think they can do. A lot of them think they can do, do it better. Uh, they want to bring a business model to your nonprofit. I mean, just little stuff I've seen like that. You know, I've never done this in their life. So I think a big part of Zalai Chef is beginning for me is beginning to you know ask, listen, be willing, you know, take direction, discuss. Uh, I, I think that for me that's been very helpful in moving things forward. I think I would just add, you know, in this last few weeks over the last few years, I've seen different types of allies. There are definitely folks, and I think they, I put them more in the accomplice category that Latifah described, that have done the work. They've done the anti-racism training. They've read the books. They've been doing challenging conversations. They've stood behind Black or other POC or women leaders. Like they've, they've done that, and they know what to do in this moment of crisis, they know how to show up and what their, their place in that. I think there's the other uh, ally I see right now is like the emerging ally. This is like the new person who is just now realizing like, oh, I am super outraged about this. Um, and what I'm seeing in sort of for that new ally, um, there are a lot of questions about like, you know, like new baby, like, what do I do? What do I do? What, you know, I have this special PR background. How can you use me? How, and, and like, it's as if they want you to like shape every single ass for their like specific um, skill set in a moment of crisis. And, you know, there, and what I've been saying to folks is like, there are tons of things you can do. You can sign this petition. You can text Floyd to 5516. You can call uh, the mayor. You can, you know, you can go out and protest. You can donate. Like we have set out a number of things that you can do, like try to fit yourself into that. Um, and then once this like moment of crisis dissipates a little bit, do the intentional work of figuring out how you can actually support this, this movement in a meaningful way, given your particular set of skills. But we don't have time, Black organizers don't have time to have a one-on-one -on -one with you right now about, you know, how we can use your data background. Um, Those are all really great points. Thank you so much for sharing them. Uh, I have, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. One is related to, is this, I'm gonna just read it out so that I get it correctly. Uh, is this a moment in which national legislation or even an amendment to the constitution specifically around the use of force, inca incarceration, gun control, and police reform is being pursued as a strategy? Could the 13th amendment be amended to remove the language that has fueled the prison industrial complex? Oh, Latifah, are you talking? Uh, you're muted if you're... I said I was going to ask Orisha, the lawyer, to answer that one. <laughs> I, I don't think that we have the power uh, right now to sort of change the Constitution. Um, and I don't know that we'd want to be in that conversation given right now, given who's in power. Um, you know, I will say I think a lot of, and this is both the police violence situation, but also with relationship to COVID, a lot of the response has been national and federal. Um, but the recovery will be local. Um, and so I know we're in this sort of moment where we're looking for Trump's press conferences every day, but like every single thing that we really want is probably, most of the things that we really want are sort of controlled um, by our local government. Now there's a set of things that the federal can, government can do a la the 1994 crime bill that incentivize or disincentivize a certain set of behaviors at the local level. But I think, um, it's really important that we understand that that's where our power is located um, in this moment. Great, thank you for that. My uh, brother is a law professor and he and some of his colleagues wrote a piece that I believe is in the Washington Post this today, uh, but he was uh, telling me that it is related to this idea of really stringent statewide regulations or law, if you will, uh, requiring police officers to 
speak up or act when they see uh, misconduct among their peers. Uh, so I think that's a kind of interesting thing. I, I don't have a, a law background, but I, I think Does it's interesting. Like, don't they have that duty already? I mean, I, no, 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 they do. It's, it's about being regulated, indeed. <laughs> be a police officer, right? Their duty is to, um, you know, they have this like hero cop narrative for forever. They're supposed to help people that are in danger. And I, I, I've never heard any rule, uh, formal rule that says that someone cannot stop their coworker from doing something that is unconstitutional or abusive or harmful. Um, and so I think we have to be careful. Like, it sounds great, but like, don't they have a duty to protect already? Like, do we need to reiterate that with more specific language? You can uh, write that, you can write that, um, you can write that into uh, use of force policies called duty to intervene. You can require it. And if somebody doesn't do it, then they can basically be disciplined. Um, you can do that. Not you got to do that because John Lewis said one time, when you can't change people's hearts, change the law. And that's what black people have been doing for centuries, right? We haven't, you know, I don't know how many hearts are going to change. I hope you want to hope that hearts will change. But one of the reasons black folks have pursued laws, like any law, civil rights law, is because that's the one thing you do have control over. So mm -hmm. any law that can help, uh, you know, us not become the victims, you always gotta remember what brought you to the table. What brought us to the table are these deaths, right? And other things are gonna come into play, but in the end, Trayvon should be alive, you know, Floyd should be alive, anything, anything that can get to that uh, is, is what we're looking for. And so when I hear the laundry list, I gotta make sure that laundry list has a chance of doing that. Uh, when people come up with stuff, they just throw stuff out. And the other thing is that most of this, especially now at this time, because of who's running things, which I don't say that person's name, um, <laughs> it, it, fear, people is, fear is gonna be the thing that's going forward. Everybody's fear, this is gonna happen, it's gonna change, it won't be any more America, all this, they're going to scare, contract, and scare you to death when all people are saying is that, you know, take your foot off my neck, right? So that's the climate that we're working in. Uh, and that, that, that's the real hard thing here because uh, every time I talk to folks, they think like, you know, it's, no, no, but black folks have always worked in that anytime, whether it be the end of slavery, you know, <laughs> after reconstruction, look what happened after reconstruction. It destroyed everything that had been moved forward. So that's why it's good to know history because history tends to repeat itself. Those things are still there, the patterns are still there. And um, I, I'm just saying that to say, th this is the climate that we're in. And as you're in that climate, you know, you gotta, you got like I said, without guarantee and, when, and you can't get discouraged when things come up and you won't have all the answers all the time right away. So when I get a question like that, I don't know. Things will be revealed. And that's why you gotta be in it for the long haul. Evaluate, go back, move forward. Dr. King was real good about that. Continue to evaluate strategy. I wanna thank you both for your points you made. Alicia, absolutely spot on that that is your job. Like as, forget the, your job as a police officer, your job as a, as a human. Uh, but I also appreciate your point, Dr. Marshall, in terms of what it looks like to then penalize people for not doing what they're supposed to do to actually put some sort of repercussions for not doing what you're supposed to do. Uh, but then again, that comes into this larger issue of the power of laws versus the power of a more grassroots um, organizing approach, approach that changes kind of norms and the way people attempt to change how people think. I would like to ask one more question and then I would like to ask each of you to give kind of your parting, parting thoughts. So my last question is, how can we continue to uplift the missions and great voices from community organizers? And what is the best way to do this as we slowly reopen our economy? How can social media awareness be sustained? And so I, I, I'm understanding this as, as things start moving I don't want to say back because I'm hoping they're not moving back, but as we start moving forward uh, uh, into a different phase, what does it look like to support uh, organizers and the like as people go back to work, as, as things like that change? Any thoughts on that? I think we're all just trying to figure that out, right? Um, 
I don't, I'm nervous. I said just yesterday, what if people forget about black people in three weeks? <laughs> you know, again, um, for those of us who've committed our whole lives to this work, we're, we're hoping that um, the, the, the moral compass stays center in people, that humanity is, is critical and that we can get there through policy change, but we need to get there also through the moral will of, of, a, of a divided nation. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Fair enough. Any other thoughts on, on that? Well, I've met a lot of people that I didn't know before because of this, and that's great. And I plan to keep in, keep, keep in touch with them. Um, I, I'm hoping that at least, you know, I can expand uh, the number of people who are engaged in, in the, I, you know, I don't call it the word, in the struggle, because to me it's the struggle. Uh, that, that word doesn't change. And, uh, you know, keep them supported and focused because you get tired. You can get tired doing this work. Well, you can get exhausted. I don't get tired because to me, for me, tired is like giving up. That's just my word, you know. But you can get, you can get exhausted. Um, uh, I would like more of an intersection. One of the things I, re I re remembered about the, 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 the civil rights movement is there was a real intersection between athletes, entertainers, and I guess I would call this common folk. Uh, you know, Malcolm knew Ozzy Davis and Ruby D and, and Martin. I'd like there to be more of an intersection there. Uh, it's funny, I've been doing a radio show for years and Latifah knows this. And the, you know, the hardest people I have at getting on the show just to advise young people about, you know, how they were able to navigate through life have been athletes and entertainers. And there seems to be this huge gap between them and the people. And so I think, I think, you know, if we can, if, if all of us who want to do something, you know, can, can sort of cross paths in some way, uh, you know, we're all, we're all doing it. Not so much, we're all doing what we're good at, but I think it would void, a, in, in this case, this movement, if each, if a lot of us knew, you know, each other and able to access each other, uh, I, I think that, and I haven't figured that out yet, um, but I think that would help because then they would feel there's this, this group of people, not just up here, but people down there that they were connected with. And I think that connection, I mean, I, I, part of the reason I got into this is people would say, you know, people, you know, a lot of black professionals don't want to deal with these kids and why do you, right? So, um, you know, they used to tell me, you a cool PhD, right? You know, they would say things like that, which was ridiculous. But I think I would like to see that happen. I'm not sure exactly how to do that because they live in these other worlds. But uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm working on that and see if I can make, make that happen. I think that's important. That's because fantastic. literally, if you look at those three young, those men, it doesn't matter whether you're, uh, you know, uh, you're making $200 million playing basketball or whether you're just a boy in the hood. You could be Armand Arbery. You could be Christian Cooper. You could be uh, 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 George Floyd. And if you have one woman, you could be Breonna Taylor. So get rid of those divisions. I think that's something that's existed for a while that shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an important point. Uh, Alicia, did you want to add in something? Sure. I mean, I think we anticipate that um, the, the public sort of de demonstrations will dissipate at some point. Um, and, uh, that's okay. Like, you know, this has been a relatively like traumatic triggery moment for I think so many people. Um, and while I think like the revolution will certainly be televised, the deal will be made with the cameras off. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, what I have seen at least between 2015 when a lot of this kicked off and there were breaks for months, like I, there were months where I was like, what happened to all the videos? Like they like literally stopped. We were seeing them like every other week and then they like stopped for a minute. Um, but it was in those moments where I think people had a moment to like breathe and really reassess what was happening that our demands got more specific. We, become, we became much more clear um, about what we wanted. And I think it's made us so much more prepared in this moment to actually push the conversation forward in a way that we weren't ready to or able to or prepared to um, uh, in 2012 or 2015. Um, what I hope is that, um, 
you know, one of the things that I experienced in this moment, not only just as a daughter whose father has recently passed, but also as a Black woman, and understanding that, you know, something could happen to me tomorrow or to my niece tomorrow, and the outcry is not going to be the same. It's the same for our LGBT um, family. And so, like, these things continue to happen, whether or not there's a national spotlight. And, um, you know, my hope is that, uh, you know, calls for justice for George um, are... Um, uh, uh, calls for Brianna are as 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 large um, um, as they were were for George, and I think um, after things dissipate, it's really important that people continue to tell the stories of other people that might not attract the same national attention as the story did. Absolutely, it's interesting because now both of you, uh, Dr. Marshall and Orisha, have shared kind of some concepts that would be a great like wrapping final words piece. That said, that does not preclude you from continuing to do another rap or final word. But I will say, um, I think this is the time for us to go ahead and do that. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll start with you, Latifa, and then if Dr. Marshall or Orisha want to add anything in, they are welcome to. And if they feel like they've got it, then we'll move from there. You know, I just saw in a notification a minute ago that uh, assembly member, Dr. Shirley Weber um, on the floor in Sacramento. Um, I'm, I'm super emotional about what I just read. Um, she apologized to black men for not being able to protect them. And um, I think that's right. You want to protect your people, your tribe. And um, with all that we know and all that we do, you know, in the United States now, um, you know, a block from me, three houses from me, folks are just struggling to survive. And we want to be protectors. I, Shirley is a protector. And no matter what we do, the reality that the dehumanization of people with black skin is a fact um, tells me that you know we can work to the end of time but until we all agree um, that our humanization and our winning black people winning means everybody wins right so i apologize i haven't cried in a long time but um yeah thank you well, let me just say that says why we're here. I mean, that's why we're here. We're here just for that reason because of the pain, the trauma. Oh Lord, stop! The pain, the trauma, everything that we have been through. Uh, it's, that's it right there. That, 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 that's why we do. We don't want no more of that. And it's not just the last couple of months. It's like history, period. And it. it, it that's what people will understand. That's why we're doing this. We don't want, you know, mothers crying for their kids. We don't want, you know, it, it's, it's that simple. And um, that's what fuels us. That's what drives us. Uh, don't get it confused, folks. Exactly what you saw there is it. And we ain't doing it for an apology. We're doing it for it to stop. It's as simple as that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, she talked about her daughter. That's why I do it. You know, because I've been saying we're not all related, but we're all family. And uh, people got who are, you know, who are watching, listening, whatever, you understand what's behind this. It is not political. <laughs> it ain't all those things, those bags you might put it into. It's simply that we want that to stop. And uh, we're not going to stop till it does stop. I'm going to wrap it right there. I want you to know, Latifa, that I am sending you the warmest of embraces through this uh, little box here that Zoom has for me um, and has for all of you. Uh, thank you all for this time. Um, this, is, this has been a tough conversation to have. Um, this is a tough, it's a, and tough isn't the word, but I just thank you for uh, how you closed us off, um, Latifa and Dr. Marshall and Orisha. You all were fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.